Welcome to Not So Standard Deviations. This is episode 86, and I'm Roger Peng from the Johns Hopkins Data Science Lab, and I'm here with Hillary Parker of Stitch Fix. Uh, we are back from our brief summer hiatus uh, with a whole new episode. We're going to catch up on some email uh, from our listeners. We're going to follow up on project organization and talk about data analysis as software. Uh, we're also talking about foot pedals, live streaming, whatever happened to SaaS, and version control systems. I've got like a number of responses to the last episode that you weren't on. Oh, yeah, um, cool. So I can deal with that. And then... Um, Shoot, and I meant to listen, and I totally haven't yet. I don't, I don't expect you to listen. <laughs> no, but I want to hear like Jenna. I, yeah, I'm interested. It's, <laughs> okay. not just, it's not just like a polite thing. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, have you listened to any of our other episodes? <laughs> No, no, because like, I guess you're on them, right? Doesn't? Uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, but like e the one, even the ones where like I'm not on them, I don't always. Anyway, I did start listening to podcasts again. Like I, um, I started listening to the Josh Marshall podcast. Okay, I haven't heard that. Yeah. One. Have you? Do you know him? No. It's Talking Points Memo. Oh so yeah. Like okay. A, yeah, he's so smart. It's yeah, I really like him, uh, and so I was. I saw the ad podcast episode and I was like, I should check it out. And it was such a, it was such a reminder of the fact that you really do feel like you're friends with someone when you're listening. Right. It's like, it's a very like intimate connection you have where it's like they get in your head. Essentially. Yeah. It's borderline yeah. dangerous. I, I would say. Yeah. No, it's like, you feel like friends and then you feel like, um, like I found myself like really thinking about him the next day, like and like what he was saying. You know, it's like you're just really engaged with them. Right. It's really interesting. Yeah. It's interesting to think that we're those people to so many. <laughs> <laughs> we had a conversation on my other podcast about how like a lot of people listen to podcasts at like one and a half or you know, speed or twice the speed. Yeah. And then and then if you meet that person in real life, mm -hmm. they they sound super slow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you like, had that happen well i don't listen on uh, i so i listen at 1x speed to whatever yeah, so too. if i ever meet someone they should sound roughly the same but i have had people come up to me saying it's weird because your voice is so much slower and like for example they watch all of my coursera videos at like 2x or whatever you know yeah yeah and so uh That's i have funny. people say that to me you know i did finally i listened to an audiobook at 1.25 but it was I don't know what the guy literally was talking so slow. I was oh. like, I, I never do that. But for this one, I was like, okay, this, this gets into like a reasonable pace. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But well, <sighs> um, you were not far from our minds. So on the last episode, Jenna crawl, uh, sat in your chair. Yes. Um, well, not literally. Cause that would be, <laughs> I'm just sitting here in my cross-legged chair. Like, <laughs> Oh, did she? Like, <laughs> I should have one of those like chairs um, installed in my office, so like for when yeah. guests come. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I like. It. <laughs> no, she came up to visit here, so I I just stuck her on the podcast, and um, we had a whole conversation about project organization. Yeah. So I, I felt like you should have been there, um, but alas. Um, what were the key takeaways? Yeah. Well, I, she and I both agreed that there is there was no um we didn't feel like there was like a universal strategy for organizing data analysis projects yeah that works mm -hmm. from start to finish i yes i i somewhat agree but i feel like there's probably general principles the, uh, very yeah i mean there are some broad principles but you have to be kind of willing to i don't know i feel like you have to you have to be quite adaptive as you go through. Um, I agree with that, but I also use uh, like one project template, like the project template package, and I do structure my code the same way every analysis. But I also do much less extensive analyses than you guys do. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's not. It's not so much extensiveness. I think it's more variety. Uh, you know, I I think that like the way that I might organize the analysis for like. A large epidemiological study of air pollution and health is just different from the way I'm going to organize like the analysis of a small clinical trial, uh, and it's different from the way I'm going to an analyze like I don't know something else. But um, so that's okay. Guess, but that's but that's okay. I think like different projects require different have different requirements, right? 
Yeah, um, it's just that for me, it would be a scaling up or a scaling down of one system. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I have the source code. Like in Project Template, there's like the different folders. And so there's like the munch step and all the stuff goes in there that is just for data cleaning. And then you sort of clean up the data set and save it. And then you like go into the source folder and that's all the data. Those are all the scripts for like analyzing the data. So to me, the only difference would be like, maybe the munch stuff is super fast and the source code is like one file versus the source code is like 12 files. Okay. Well, let me, but let me give you an example and see, and let me, I, I like to get your opinion on it. So like I'm working on one project now that broadly speaking is like linking population health data to air pollution exposure. Um, but a big part of the analysis is developing a prediction model to predict what the pollution exposure is for everybody at you know, their location. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so, and then once you have those predictions, then we can kind of do a, like a regression model to see what the association is with health. Okay. So mm-hmm. like, so building the prediction model though, is like a pretty big task, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So is that a separate project or is that a pro like a sub project within this project? I, I, I get what you're saying because sometimes I break it out to a separate project at that well, point. I think in my mind, I think there's a threshold. Like if the prediction model is like, we're just going to put three variables in a regression and like, that's not a separate project. Right. Yeah. But yeah. if it's like, we're going to integrate like a hundred different data sources and do all this machine learning or whatever, then maybe it is a different project. Yeah. But then, but that project doesn't really make sense by itself. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause I'm not going to use it for anything. I'm not going to like, it'd be one thing if I were going to like publish a paper about the model. Right. But if I'm not going to do that, then it's like, it's just kind of hanging out there all by itself. Yeah. I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> and I, so I do agree it feels though like you could still those are still general like the um max coon's uh recipes package and parsnip and everything um like builds in some of this like common machine learning workflow steps you know like oh you like take away the validation set and then use that as different from the training and test set and you know what i mean like there's I mean, that's obviously dealing with the data set, not with them, like, not with, like, where do you put the model building code, but, like, even what you just described is, like, common enough that I was just like, oh, yeah, you have to do that, right? So there, ostensibly, someone could design, like, an optimal system for it. Well, it's not so much the coding that I'm talking, I mean, I'm talking about, like, do the files go in the same directory as like the overarching project or do they get put into a separate, like do they go in the same Git repository or do you have a separate Git repository for the prediction model project? Yeah. But don't you think if you built like what you viewed as an optimal system for the prediction model storage, like, and like where the code goes and whatever, and then where the code goes for how you use it in the analysis, like, wouldn't you want to reuse that the next time you had to do a similar task? Um, I mean, it's that's that's you think that's a question that's easily answered. Yeah. But the problem is that <laughs> I, I I don't want to get too much into the weeds because it's like not that interesting. But it's like you know if you were going to do another analysis that was exactly the same except for maybe like one tiny little detail, then yes, I would reuse that model, right? But that's never been the case for me because like usually so like the prediction model predicts pollution levels for like a given year right um if you want to like predict levels for like a different year which is often the case um you kind of have to change the model (laughs) right right. because it's like the data sets are different now and it's like it's um anyway well so okay no but like so yeah sure changing the model like you're starting a totally new thing and you need to redo this like entire analysis from scratch and not just like change the year but at that at at that point wouldn't you still want to use the same scaffolding as last time like here's where the code goes for creating the model and here's where the code goes for testing the model and here's where the code goes for you know using the model potentially yeah i mean i mean so the okay but that doesn't answer the question of like what do i do for the first project well yeah because like for the first project it's like okay well if I plan for the future, it makes sense to have two separate Git repositories, one for the analysis and one for the prediction model, and manage them simultaneously, right? Yeah. Um, but if that next analysis never happens, then 
<laughs> I'm just giving myself more work, right? Um, but yeah, and, and also it's the, like you need a system you can scale up and scale down flexibly. Right. Which is, yeah, which was kind of like going back to that like opinionated analysis development thing. It's like, yeah, here's all the different principles and you definitely don't need to use them every time, but you need to know they exist so that if you need to flex up, like, you know what to do and you might have to refactor, but I think okay. my problem yeah. is that like this, the, the timeline at which things occur, for example, if I'm going to like write this the plan or do like do this project, like the paper's going to be done two years from now, like the papers will be out two years from now. Right. So let's say, okay. So, so maybe like a year from now I decide, okay, well, we want to do something different using the same kind of structure. Um, often like enough has changed that like I kind of need to redo the whole thing anyway because like maybe maybe the EPA changed the format that it you know it's, it, uh, it it makes this data available or maybe the data is available in this w other website not at this website or maybe they increased the resolution so now the data is better you know it's like usually enough has changed that I can't just like slot in the code right I have to kind of rewrite the code well yeah I think maybe I feel like I'm not articulating myself well like to me, yeah, like every, I actually, I've like officially decided to try to write code from scratch when I can versus like saving this little script of like, here's how I query this database to get this data. Like, really? Yeah, because I'm at the point where I realize it's like I want to improve my fluency. So doing things like that, like doesn't give me the opportunity to like practice, like having memorized or just knowing the code I need. Like, I, I set myself up for success in any situation if I just, like, if someone asked me, like, hey, how do you get data to know, like, a client's shipment history? I'm just like, blah, blah, blah. Like, here's, like, I have this all mapped out in my head and I totally understand it. Uh -huh. Versus if I'm like, let me search for that one script I use every time. That's like, that's like me going to Google Translate every time I want to talk to someone and, you know, <laughs> like, wherever. This feels, um, it feels radical. Yeah, I think that the design thinking, the purposeful practice is why I've been doing it. Or that's how I'm, I kind of did it already because I've never been organized enough to have like, I mean, I have a coworker who just has one huge file with like basically every script he's written. And then he's one of these people who like never uses his mouse. It's just like click, 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 then like five <laughs> windows have appeared. And, <laughs> and so, it. and he can like search for the script. And so I guess what I'm saying is that's not a skill I want to develop, like searching a script for code versus doing it from scratch. I feel like it's just like building from principles. I don't know. Yeah. I, I could, I sympathize uh, with that approach. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it seems to fly in the face of like notions of reusability and uh, modularity. That's true. Yeah. It's, I don't necessarily do this for production code, just for analysis code. Yeah. Also, I, for me, um, I, I, I don't know, it, it, not in every case, but there's a certain amount of enjoyment that comes from just kind of like coding it yourself and learning as you go. Mm -hmm. um, totally. In some yeah. cases, yeah. And it's not like the most efficient, but it, uh, you get it, there's like, maybe efficiency isn't the only goal. <laughs> yeah. I, I just watched, oh, what was it called? Oh, I can't remember the name of the movie. It was so good, though. It was about the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Oh, was it the big short? No, it was... No, um, no, the other one. Uh, the well, other one with, like... Oh, <laughs> uh, what's his name? That British actor who's, like, so ridiculously good. Um, yeah, I know. Anyway. Maybe I'll look it up. I, yeah, I can't remember, but at one point, this guy is talking about, like, oh, you know... Like I used to, I used to be an engineer and I built a bridge and kind of like calculating all the hours uh, that he saved for people because they didn't have to drive, you know, all the way down to the next bridge. And then at the end, this guy's just like, I don't know, some people might want to take the long way to work. Like, <laughs> <it's just> like <laughs> I remember thinking I was like laughing because I was like, yeah, that, that's like, yep, maybe I want to take the long way to work. Um, was it margin call, <laughs> was it? Margin call, yeah, that okay. was what it was. Okay. God, it was good. I so recommend it. It's got Kevin Spacey, so you have to feel a little weird about yeah. it. He's I, so good, though. It's I like, heard good. Yeah, <laughs> I heard good things about it. Yeah, it's so. It's yeah. I was really impressed, but um, it's yeah. Anyway, the point is, I'm viewing it as the moment of purposeful practice, where I'm like, I want to be someone who, like, if an idea comes up to me in a meeting, I can 
write that idea. I can like, like, oh, we want to query this. I don't have to go and search code. I can just be like, and like have the code flow out of me <laughs> that produces the answer, you know? Like that level of fluency is something I care about. Well, I, I think it says something though, like in terms of the examples that you give, um, I, I feel like maybe like you're in situations where it's useful for you to kind of, to kind of like be able to quickly verbalize the kind of like the answer mm -hmm. uh, direct kind of like directly from your person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas like, not, I think like, you know, I think that's maybe more common if you're like in, like I think it's maybe not everyone's going to be in that situation in a sense. Like, uh, like th there's always going to be plenty of time to just kind of Google it or look it up or whatever. Totally. Um, yeah. That's true too. I mean, I think like, I think for tidy verse code, I, to me, that always is, it's always worth being fluent in that, or at least that's been my experience. Like I used to copy paste like GG plot code. And then when I finally learned all the principles actually from Dave Robinson, um, which I think I've even said on this podcast before, but he did a really good job of teaching, like, here's like what the aesthetics mean and whatever. And after that, I never had to look at like stack overflow again. I could just like in my head, verbalize out like what I was writing. Um, and it, so it wasn't even memorizing stuff. It was just literally understanding like how to articulate myself in that language. Right. It was kind of like learning the underlying latent variables or whatever, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, like being able to just quickly go through like data reshaping and getting means and whatever, I think is just, that's just a useful skill. But also what I am talking about when I'm like, oh, I'm in a meeting and I want to be able to do X, Y, Z. A lot of that is even just knowing where our data lives in the warehouse. So that's definitely something that you wouldn't run into as much, like, you know, in your position, for example. Yeah, but, you know, there's something to be said about, like, having having those details at your fingertips, you know? Whether it's, like, knowing how to code it or, or maybe knowing it more generally, it's like... Uh, you know, I think the less you have to kind of look like if you're like if I'm in a meeting and people are asking about the data and I'm res that I'm responsible for it, like I like to have that information at my fingertips, you know, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it's not the same <laughs> when I say data, it's not the same as like when you say data, but um, but I think it's the same idea, though. Yeah, same idea. It's like you want to be able to in some sort of scenario, not be inhibited by anything except for your brain. <laughs> <laughs> and your nerves i'm not sure yeah because sometimes in meetings i am i'm like oh i know how to do this but i'm like stressed out and i can't actually in this moment do right. it <laughs> <laughs> so i want to yeah. i want to get to there's two emails that we got that i want to mention one comes from chris and uh, he wrote a long email about how he organizes uh his projects but the gist of it is basically that um every project is in our package yeah yep which i I kind of understand, but disagree with is what it comes down to. That's sort of where I am too. Although I like, yeah, I would rather have a tool that was built for the thing you're doing, not like a tool you've repurposed. Yeah. I think that's point number one. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think, yeah, well, maybe that's the only point. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, this is an idea that's been like floating around. And I also, I think that this is partially why, we haven't seen like packages for analysis, whatever you would call that, like right. take off is because it's like, how much would you even really change from the way packages work? Potentially not much. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's a totally valid approach where it's like, I, it's like there's a place for doc, like essentially the documentation becomes the analysis, I think. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. And then like all the functions are stored. I also think it assumes a level of function writing that is far beyond what I do. <laughs> you mean, like, like I'm lucky. Yeah. Like if, if you're like structuring your project around the idea that like you fundamentally want these like general purpose functions for your analysis, I'm like, oh yeah, I do not write that way. <laughs> I don't either, and I find like I feel like that's a strange analysis, honestly. Like, mm -hmm. I think I could see how like in some situations, like it's sometimes it's very obvious that like when you're analyzing the data that this that you're gonna have to do this like a thousand times, basically. Mm -hmm. and I think right. there are a lot, like for example, like maybe in some bioinformatics pipelines or 
or very complicated kind of like chained analyses um, that like, okay, this, you, you know long in advance that this thing is going to have to be done like a, a thousand times by different people. And so obviously there's going to be a function mm-hmm. for that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, but like, I think in general, like I find it very hard to, to, to like start an analysis and be like, yes, we need a function for this. We need a function for this. We need a function for that. I, like, w- like right off the bat or even midway through. Um, cause yeah, I, I, I just, it's hard to kind of like generate that level of abstraction until, you know, even at the very end, it's like, once you're done, then it's kind of like, well, yeah. Like what's the point? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to agree. I think it's a very R way of programming. Like in Python, it's much more common to just write a ton of functions and then like string them together. I see. Okay. Yeah. I, but Again, I don't know why one's necessarily better than the other. Like, I'll usually take someone's Python code and, like, remove the function and, like, remove the indent okay. <laughs> and just, like, write it, like, R code. I'm like, okay, this function's confusing me. Let me, like, delete that part right. and just, like, go through this as if it's a step-by-step analysis so I can see the intermediate objects, you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah, it almost makes it harder to translate to someone because you can't hand them a function and like if they need to do it's like what you're saying if i need to do exactly what they were doing then great but if not i have to like rip out the actual code from the function in order to like start from scratch (laughs) anyway i'm just i was doing that at work this week which is why (laughs) it's it's, thinking uh, about it yes it's fresh in your mind i've I've learned a lot about like making the cursor you know the like alt control down or what like in r to remove the index so you can have like one cursor over multiple lines okay i don't think i know what you're talking about so go on oh it's like if you want the cursor to span three lines and then when you click backspace it like does the backspace for all three of the lines oh okay Okay. have you never done that that's like life-changing i don't know i don't think so wow yeah it's well it's huge if you do this type of thing where you're like oh i have this super long file and i need to delete all the like i mean the indents you could probably i'm sure there's i'm sure people who like are better at this than me are like oh you highlight do like control one two five and like the indents go away or something okay. <laughs> but, well i'm not that person i'm definitely not that person maybe you should be since you <laughs> it takes you forever to delete your indents since it's like eight spaces <laughs> oh that was uh that would Can't hurt a get away bit. from that one yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you should definitely anyway i think on well I, I have a windows keyboard even though i have a mac but it's like control alt down and then the cursor it just like becomes a super long cursor you know okay like a, anyway it's it's nice and it is very handy when you're trying to gut a function because in python the indents matter you know so, right yeah. which i always found yeah. intriguing I ran into something really funny yesterday where I was calling this function. I was using reticulate to call it from R because of this fluency thing. Like it's just, I know I'm doing the exact same thing, but with Python, I'm like always like, I'm just not fluent in Python by any stretch. And I'm so fluent in R that it is literally easier for me to call Python functions in R and then like work with objects there than to like be in python and then be like oh is this a list i'm not sure list is different than a vector like you know and then um and so i was calling this function and i was getting back uh empty results and but it was like a i was eventually doing an api call so it gives me like the number so it was like a 200 response it was like valid response but it was empty and i was like crap okay something happened with like you know, the R translation. So then I went to Python and redid the whole thing and then learned that I was getting an empty response there too. Uh (laughs) And then it, and then I like figured out what in the code was causing that. So then I went back to R and it worked and I was like, Oh, like I bashed R when I shouldn't have, like I didn't bash (laughs) R, but I was just like, Oh, this didn't work. Like you didn't give um, it the benefit of the doubt. I didn't give it the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. I mean, also part of the reason I didn't was because when my coworker came over and I was showing him what didn't, I was calling his function. I was like a little embarrassed. (laughs) He was like, what? I was like, Oh yeah, I'm doing this in R. And like, (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> it was just, it made things more, it was like hard to communicate with him about it, even though he like, he's a statistician. He's definitely, he like knows R. it's not a big deal, but it's just like <laughs> having people see the backbends I go through for this stuff. I was like, okay, I'll switch to Python. <laughs> it was like the easiest thing. And then I like went back to him. I was like, guess what? It's just empty. And then we went through the function and figured out what was going on. But you had, you had a little R shame. Yeah, I did have R shame. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I had R shame. Oh, so sad. Um, what one last point I want to get in before I forget is that uh, what I think in terms of like organizing data analysis as software, I think the issue is like you know, if you ever whatever I've cr like set out to write a software package, so not a data analysis. Like if the software package in my mind was not well specified, um, then it's just it's like extremely hard to write. You know, because mm -hmm. you don't know what functions to write. You don't know, like, what, like, the user is going to want to do. And, you know, it's, like, it's very hard to write. And um, and so it's, like, you have to have a pretty good specification of the package in terms of, like, what's the API going to be and things like that in order to, you know, in order to kind of, like, let it to write the thing. And I think with data analyses, often for me, like, it, it's, like, I have no idea what I'm doing <laughs> at yeah. the beginning. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's so poorly specified that organizing it in, as like a software package, like it just doesn't work. I, you know, I can me. see that. And yeah. I, think... I mean, I don't like, so I use the project template thing, which, you know, we've talked about on and off, but for me, it's like every first X steps are the same where it's like, I spin up the project, <laughs> I delete the, like the folders I don't want, which I'm sure I can configure it to never create them. And then, um, I always, then go in and specify the packages I think I'll need, which is some, you know, set of things. And then after that, I go and specify, um, or then I go and do the data pull. Like I, I put the data for getting the code into the munge folder. And that's like almost always, for me, that's almost always like not even the same, but those steps always happen. Like there's never, there's no scenarios where that doesn't happen. Right. I guess if I was doing a simulation, but then, well, anyway, then that munch step would still just be like generate data or something. And then, um, and then after that, I'd go into the source file and then it's like, okay, now, now what? Like that's the big empty thing looking at me. Right. But I guess I could see in packages how it might be the same where like, once you get familiar with it, there's like a way to flex up or flex down. And there are these like repetitive things, but yeah, I guess where would you just do the interactive coding? Like that's, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm not, yeah, you know, it's like I guess you could you could retrofit it into the package structure. Like it's not like it's impossible, but it's not really yeah. natural. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, like I almost everything I have is interactive coding. I as discussed, I don't really put things into functions that much. I mean, and then it's a totally different story if it's a production pipeline. I mean, that's just almost like a that's like a different thing. Yeah, that's I think not, so. I think it's just yeah. A, yeah. Um, one more bit of follow up from that episode, <laughs> as we've been going on for twenty minutes. Um, uh, I mentioned we talked a little bit about version control tools like Git, and uh, I think I made a comment along the lines of uh, I didn't think that version control tools were particularly useful for data analysis, um, uh -oh. uh, or at least I didn't think that they were not useful. I just didn't think they added that much. Um, Ouch. And, uh, <laughs> we'll we'll discuss that in a second, but let me read this email from Mike, uh, who says that one reason why maybe version control software is not as valuable for analysis and software develop as it is for software development is that software development is primarily a team sport and analysis is primarily an individual sport. I agree. Um, yeah, you agree with that? Okay, I, that's not what I expected. Okay, um, and that version control version control software is optimized for having multiple people work on a project simultaneously, which is not common in analysis. Mm -hmm. I I do agree with that for sure. I so think, you don't? Yeah. Well, uh, there's degrees. I think like for me, for sure, that's exactly how it works. Like I don't. I mean, for me, like it's true for both software and analysis. Like I just work by myself. But right, yeah. um, <laughs> but for analysis, for definitely, like I just I generally do the whole thing myself, or I don't do, or I don't work on like like if so if I'm like supervising a student, the student does all the work. Like I'm not really involved. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> 
this is it's just funny i don't know <laughs> i mean yeah that's good you're not micromanaging well i mean like, it's their project right they're gonna get the credit they get the paper they you know it's like <laughs> so they're doing the work uh, but if it's my project then i'm doing all the work like i can't depend on anybody to do the work for yeah. me, right so yeah um and, and i don't you know and i think I think even in like, you know, I don't have like a big lab or anything, but even in groups where there's like a big lab, I think just because the way that academia is structured, everyone kind of like does their own thing because everyone has to ultimately become this like independent investigator. Um, but um, it, it's, so I, th- so I think I kind of get that. And I think the issue with the version control that I, that I meant just to recap from last time, which is that like the benefits, like the things that the version control system give you, I think are seldom taken advantage of when you're analyzing, when you're doing like a data analysis project, at least I seldom take advantage. Like I, you know, I write my commit, I write my commit messages just like everybody else. You know, I look at, <laughs> I look at the, sometimes it's useful to look at the Git log to see like, okay, what mm-hmm. happened? <laughs> you yeah. Know? But I never revert back. I know ne- I yeah. almost never like do multiple branches. Yeah. Um, and uh, I almost, and you know, what are the other things? Like, I, I don't, if I don't collaborate with anybody, like I never, well, most of my data analysis projects, I can't like share them, right? So they're not like on some public GitHub or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that like we, it, I, I it's hard to take advantage of the features like that Git offers. Uh, I, I completely agree. And I agree with the person who wrote in too that like, yeah, like I use Git, on our like we you know we use github to manage our production pipelines and there it's like very clear that this is like a shared entity and you know who's doing what and we all have it's like it's clear this is something we're all tending to together you know uh versus when with my personal code i agree that it's sort of a cost that is marginally useful most of the time (laughs) i a few times i've gone back I've liked having version control for viewing the history of a file and being like, shoot, I know I wrote that and then I deleted it. So let me go back and find where I wrote it. Yeah, Um, I've done the same. Yeah, so that's helpful. Not that that, you know, that would be like in Google Sheets too, though. It's not like... (laughs) I, mean, I, I feel like the cost is not that high, so might as well I was about to say that. Like, the cost isn't high. And it's like... I mean, I do think people who like need feedback, GitHub's like really optimized for giving feedback. So you can do like inline commentary on code. And so if you were looking for feedback from a coworker or something, that could be pretty useful. But yeah, no, I tend to agree with you completely. I mean, I put I put all of my analyses on an internal. I we actually I put it on GitLab for we have both GitHub and GitLab. Uh-huh. And so um and that one's like not in the cloud or whatever, so it's safer. You know, you don't have to worry about accidentally like publishing right. <laughs> proprietary data or something. But um, we, yeah, like having that, I put it there just so that it lives somewhere and I can link it to someone and they can clone it easily. But that's about it. Right. You know, right? There's not like much more on top of it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's. That's another tool, though, that I wish I were fluent in that I am totally not. Which tool? <laughs> Git in oh. general. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's fine if things are working, but if something doesn't work, it's like complete panic, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> I know I've said this before because Mara Averick, like, made a, made like a little, <laughs> like, did one of her drawings of me being like, if I have a problem on Git, it's like I have no idea how I got here, and I have no idea if I will get out, or like, right. like some sort of completely catastrophic, right. like <laughs> the end of the world is here. <laughs> right, it goes from like zero to like a thousand really quickly. It does. It's like all of a sudden, like code's gone. Like those merge messages, I'm just like, oh my god, there's like could be something weird. There could be some weird line of like those little carrots or something yeah like i don't know (laughs) where that would be it's uh, (laughs) github actually added some like merge tools recently that were actually intuitive oh really i i because there are like a number of merge tools out there i've never used one that like all of a sudden it everything made sense (laughs) no i agree that nothing made sense but i was confident at the end of the clicks that there wasn't like some weird corrupted file out okay. there. Well, like I was like, okay, like yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of working. Okay. I, 
<laughs> it just to me it seems like every time it happens there's like no cons it's like why did you even tell me there was a problem because if i just like hit enter until you went away like it caused no problems <laughs> 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 like what's the issue anyway you're, you're quite the git power user there yeah um, <laughs> just just anyway. hit enter yeah just hit enter uh all right wq all right <laughs> <laughs> uh you know it's funny you mentioned wq because i guess you're using vi for your git messages right well not intentionally it's just oh, yeah, what yeah. happens yeah <laughs> i was so i was like using a system i tried to, it was i was using a linux system somewhere Oh, I think it was like I was like I had like I have like a digital ocean server that I was using and like I was using Git on there. It's like a Linux, like a new Ubuntu Linux. And um mm -hmm. and I was, you know, I was writing I was, you know, I was gonna commit something and the editor that came up was do you remember the editor Pico? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like you know, it's like one of these old Unix editors that that was kind of like the basis of an old mail program called Pine. So there was like this old. How do you know all this? It's what I used in college. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Like so, to read email, I use Pine, and to edit, to like write, compose email, you use this editor. It's called Pico, and um, and I had, I, I think, the last time I saw it was like when I was in college, and so I like, I guess the, for whatever reason, the default editor like on this stock DigitalOcean Linux server was Pico. So like I went to do the commit message. I'm like, what is <laughs> happening? <laughs> like, I, like this is not, you know, it's like, it's rare that someone's like, oh, I prefer VI, you know? Like, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now I was like, get me out of here. I, I didn't know how to exit. It was like, it was like. No, that's the worst. When you don't know how to exit, it's like sheer panic. It's like, oh my God, do I just have to turn on my computer? Right. Like, <laughs> And if it's on the cloud, you can't even do that. I'm like, I'm about like, to shut down the server. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's horrible. It's like, it's horrible. Anyway. It's, like, um, why does it have to be so hard to exit? Like, that's the only thing I've I've memorized for Vim is like the, like, what, semicolon WQ? Right. Or, yeah. Colon WQ, like, yeah. Like, get me out. <laughs> like, that's the only way I know how to go. <laughs> like, well, FYI, if you ever get stuck in Pico, control X. Oh, all right. That's not bad. I mean, it means something completely different in other contexts. Right. But <laughs> yeah, you know. But you know, when you're panicking, everything is <laughs> irrational, right? Like it's just like we haven't yet gotten to like pedals or something. Like that's like there's no one at Stitch Fix yet who has pedals at work. Have you seen this? No. What are you talking about? Oh, like if you're a real programmer, uh -oh. like a 10x programmer. Yeah, okay. you can actually like like there are pedals you can buy. Like you stick that, them under your desk or something. Yeah, that like you can program to have whatever keystrokes. So I think people. No. Need, yeah, it's like I think the escape button. You have to use escape a lot for one of them, and so people will program it so or not. I don't know. Configure it such that the pedal is like escape. Oh my god! I know. Like you're flying. And you're that like. <laughs> I mean, the escape button's far away. You can't hit it, you know. Yeah. No, I... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Ask but, Brian Caffo if he's... He'll, like, be like, yes, I considered using pedals at one point. I, like, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but part of me feels like for some things that I, like, even for, like, if you're using escape, but, like, I feel like that there's, like, so much muscle memory there. I don't know if you're able to convert it to, like, feet muscle, you know? I, well, I've been thinking about this because I've been having some RSI in my wrist. Well, that's okay. um, that's different. Yeah. Well, no, because but it because I've had I'm not considering the pedal. <laughs> just to be clear, first of all, I sit cross-legged, so it's like ah uh, problem. Yes, that would be a problem. But um, I I've considered using the Kinesis keyboard, which is like the crazy ergonomic one. That's like I don't know. It looks like too like there's two like dips essentially. I can't even describe it, but I'm it's it's like. It. It's like the nerd computer or okay. keyboard, but that one you have to rememorize a few keystrokes too. Like they're they've like made some changes, especially around the thumbs, I think, so that like going back and forth. Or, I I can't remember, but I remember trying to use it, and I was like, "Ooh, am I really going to be able to do this?" But then everyone who uses it says like after a couple of weeks, you're like, you're like fine, like you're in on yeah. the new thing. I could so, see it taking a little getting used to. Yeah. Um. But it is weird. It's not, but it's not the same as like, like I use, I'll switch to ergonomic. I have like the Microsoft ergonomic 
uh, keyboard. And yeah. that's like, that's like super easy, but this one it's because the keys are actually in different spots. Like, Oh, so they've been like remapped to different locations. Yeah. They've I been remapped or not even remapped, but just like you look at it and you're like, Oh, the arrows and I can't even remember what it is, but right. it's enough difference that you're like, Oh, I have to unmemorize. I think maybe like shift or something, or I can't remember. Okay. But anyway, there are certain keys that get used a lot that were in bad places where they're like, we've now put this in a smart place near your thumb. Right. And it's like, I get it. And also <laughs> that seems hard. <laughs> anyway. Did you ever use Emacs when you were here? No. No. Mm-mm. No, no. I the- hated it. I- <laughs> <laughs> well, that so that you have to use control a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of people who use, I don't use Emacs anymore, but like often you'd be, they would map the control key to the caps lock key. Because um, mm. like who uses caps lock, right? So, um, and, Interesting. and Because and, like on the Mac, at least the control key is in a super awkward position. And yeah. I, I have been in a situation where like if you use it a lot, uh, it like it starts to hurt. But Yeah. Um, I've definitely had moments where my nails wore thin from certain i think from the control key that's right i've actually had this happen where like my pinky nail got like worn thin and like started to break because of hitting control so much (laughs) wow or shift or something yeah it was like yeah it was not ideal so i can totally under like i get it i get it all and i'm not above like (laughs) an alien chair (laughs) and an ergonomic setup like (laughs) it's fine yeah, it's it's all fine, but the pedals, well, yeah, it might be too far for me. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to look into this because like I want to hear if someone like uses the pedal, like <laughs> <laughs> let us know. <laughs> I'm just wondering like what else you could map it to, like, and how many pedals are there? Like, how many pedals would you have under your desk? I don't know. I think like two or three. I don't oh, now yeah. I'm like, be like... <laughs> I'm pretty sure the kinesis people like make the pedal. Oh, okay. Well, of, like one of many. Yeah. Kinesis Savant Elite programmable USB pedal. Okay. Foot switch. Sorry. Foot switch. One, two, or three pedals. All right. There we go. Okay. I'm gonna, that's going to require more thought. <laughs> I like it because in the advertising they have like a woman in heels like using it, and it's uh-huh. like, come on, no, someone, <laughs> someone using a pedal is not wearing like stilettos at work. Like, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't get me wrong, maybe, but like, also you probably take the stilettos off before you start using the pedal. That's right. Just my two cents. Um, t- I have two more things. We may or may not get through them. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. um, well, these are quick. So first, we got a. There was a. You know, I, I, there must have been a reporter that went to the USR conference. Actually, oh. um, the USR conference was in uh, Toulouse in, mm-hmm. in France, and um, yeah. it seemed like there were a lot of people there, and it seemed like it was fun. Um, but I think a reporter from Quartz was there. Oh, cool! And oh, that's right. You knew this? No, I just remember seeing. An article. Okay, yeah, there was one article about uh, Our Ladies, actually. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that's the one I remember By now. Dan yeah. Kopf, I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, it's a nice article. And they interview uh, Gabriela de Caroz. Uh, I I, I, I'm not going to try again. Um, <laughs> who, uh, you know, started the whole Our Ladies thing. So, um, yeah. It's a very nice awesome. article. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. I it was like the the lead was something like oh like maybe R is going to be the one group that solves this issue of like sexism in coding. Was it yeah right? something, yeah something like that yeah yeah something about how we're awesome yeah that's like yeah yeah which is obviously true. There was another article too, but now I can't I don't I don't seem to have the link to it <laughs> from the same meeting and uh, I don't have it so I'll try to find it and maybe stick it in the show notes. Yeah, uh, but they quoted. I think they interviewed Hadley Wickham. Of course, um, Diddly. And then well, one more email, which I think I just think is amusing. I got a, we got an email uh, from Powell, who asked, "What happened to SAS?" Uh, <laughs> is that <laughs> it? That's like the whole email. No, it's a longer email no. about how. <laughs> yeah, it's like. But anyway, I, I think the answer is not, nothing happened to SAS. Like SAS is still out there, you know. Yeah, I mean, isn't well. I feel like I have the ancient talking point of like you need to use SAS for the FDA. Um, well, yeah, I, I, that's never technically been true, and I yeah. think it's even less true now. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, it's definitely not like 
you know, I just it exists in a world that doesn't, for the most part, intersect with me, and probably almost certainly not with you. Yeah, um, for sure. But, yeah, but nevertheless, that world is big. So um, it is. Yeah, yeah. Probably if you veer over to like pharmaceutical companies, it's much more yeah popular. And we've talked about this before because they, with any proprietary company, they take on way more liability. Um, if like the functions are wrong, <laughs> right, right? And so I think. From a legal standpoint, when you're working with drug companies and there's so much risk, I think it's like a safer bet for them, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think they feel that way, at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it's actually true, like, I, I have no idea. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but, I have no idea either, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think, you know, like many other companies of this ilk, um, <laughs> they, uh, they're they they're very much into like business intelligence and, uh, uh, and data mining and kind of like building kind of these kind of dashboard platforms, that kind of stuff. And um, mm. I think um, there are, I think companies like Tableau and whatnot are kind of giving them a little bit of a run for their money, but I think they're still quite solidly, you know, in hot, you know, in the leaders in, you know, as a popular piece of software. Yeah. Yeah. I am um, the, this actually reminded me of, you know, the episode we recorded about um, the, like, Monopsony was that the right word? Monopsony. Monopsony, and um, I mean, just like the whole idea of the new type of monopoly and software engineering. And I was thinking about the. I mean, maybe we actually commented on this directly, but it's like, I mean, open source in general was the first attempt at like capturing the audience rather than becoming a traditional monopoly, right? Um, I guess, yeah. Like it if was, you have these proprietary tools and then someone's like, hey, I'm going to make one for free. And like, Right. Yeah. So by yeah. virtue of the fact that it was kind of open and available to all. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, now it's just it's just kind of funny that, I mean, this seems to be the way it's been evolving long before there was this specific issue of like data tables and dplyr or whatever. Um, that like already these people were doing it to the proprietary software. <laughs> And then someone's doing it to them. You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. It's just like a dog eat dog. World well, history out there. kind of it, it's the pendulum kind of swings back and forth. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it seems like if you if you want to change the world, anytime you're limited by like like you want essentially like you want to get to as many people as possible, and so like first like being at a big company is one way or creating the tool that everyone can use for free. And then it's like, if that tool is limited to one language, then you're limited. So then you have to create the general backend tool that like is language independent, right. um, yeah. which is like what's going on now with, you know, arrow and stuff and some of the backend data tools. So it's just, anyway, it's, that, that was my profound comment. Okay. It was just that it's happened before. Yes. I think, you know, I think with, um, well, I'm not sure. How does that relate to SaaS? <laughs> oh, just thinking about the proprietary tool, like oh, yeah. going out of popularity, and then like I guess the connection that I wasn't <laughs> making explicit was just, I mean, in my head, I was like, in in the line of work I'm in, you have to be using the open source tools. Like, there's just not, and it's better for you as a person because it's a more transferable skill going from one company to another, and um, and then but that was making me think about like the whole like well that was the point of <laughs> i mean that's a, it wasn't the original point of like richard stallman or whatever but i think that quickly it became like the how do we capture the audience tool yeah i feel like sas from a like a statistical tooling uh perspective it was kind of like the original monopoly right i mean it was like mm-hmm. you had to learn sas because that's what everyone used mm-hmm. uh outside of like quirky little research labs like at bell labs or whatever but um you know it's like you know, and and that was it. Like you know, it's like it was like not knowing how to use Windows or something like that. You know, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and I think um, I mean R and a number of other you know packages kind of broke that monopoly. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so now and it's then like became their own monopoly. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I guess <laughs> not really. No, I mean, but that was just kind of the point of that episode. Was that yeah, yeah. Now they're competing for like who can control the audience. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who can capture the most attention, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, 
So, okay, so I think that's, oh, there was, oh, what was one other thing that has transpired since we last talked, which was like a month ago, yeah. um, is that I'm a, I'm a live streamer now. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, I did see this. <laughs> I, <laughs> how'd it go? How many uh, watchers did you have? Well, you know, I, I can tell you <laughs> that I experienced a 100% increase in viewership between the first and the second live stream. So it was one person the first time, and well, two I can't time. disclose those details. <laughs> but um, no, <laughs> so the first time it was basically like, let me see if I can figure out how to make this software work. <laughs> yeah, totally. Because the live streaming software it, it requires a lot of like you know dealing with managing multiple windows and just keeping track of stuff. So it worked. There were like ten people who watched, and it was fine. Oh, yay! Yeah, and then the second time, I actually tried to do a little bit more. I mostly ended up just moving files around. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know that's part of data analysis that's hilarious um and i had 20 people watching wow did yeah. you feel like you did high quality analyses during this time uh no because like <laughs> I, the problem was like i so i just I, I i decided like i was just gonna my goal for the live stream was to just do the literal things that i would be doing right yeah. like i'm not gonna put on a show <laughs> even I kinda did, right? I'm not gonna put on a show. I don't know why that's funny. Like... No, I think I understand why you're laughing. But um, <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, what do I need to do today? And I just gotten this huge data set from uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Studies. So like, I, it's a big Medicaid da data set that I got, and I had to like, you know, deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so like, all right, well, this is what part of the this is part of the job. So this is what I'll live stream, right? So I like yeah. I had to read all these files and make sure that everything was there and nothing was missing and counting the rows. But the biggest problem I had is that like because it's like Medicaid data, I couldn't actually like show the data, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I didn't show any data. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um I'm hoping if I do another one, uh, I'll be able to actually like do some show some data, you know. Well, Will you have de-identified it or something, or uh, I might do something more on like the air pollution side, so I don't have to worry about. I it. I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I um no, I was just thinking that too, where it's like this is a cool idea. I definitely can't do it with like anything I work on. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like all proprietary. Yeah. But um, we could potentially do it for like uh the design sprint things or the design challenges. That's true. Like, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, how would you set up your Airtable connection? Right. Good idea. But it was fun, actually. So some of the people, like, were in the ch they were in the chat, you know, for the live stream. And uh, it's nice because, like, so, you know, one time I got stuck on something and someone suggested, like, oh, you know what I learned during that live stream was the whole, like, background jobs feature in RStudio. Oh. I, I don't know if you've used this before. No, I mean, but it's I do like, know the tab. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty new. So, like, I'd never used it. I knew it was there, but I'd, like, never bothered. And so I was trying to do something, and I was, like, waiting around for it to finish. And and someone was like, you could just use the background jobs feature. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, I want to learn how to do that right now. <laughs> awesome. So, it, yeah, it was fun. It no. does simulate, like, what it would be like if you were, like, training someone on the job or something. Right. I mean, it's even more because usually with the job, you don't have someone like staring at you. Like, while you're like looking over your shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although you do pair programming. So sometimes you do. Yeah. That. So this is but... instead of pair programming, this is like one on 20 programming. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. But to each person, it feels like a pair. That's true. That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. So I mean, I think, I, I think if like it was a very nice crowd of people, I think if like, there were a hundred people it could get a little unruly <laughs> perhaps, yeah but and people are like heckling you while you're right. working yeah <laughs> so, but i don't necessarily anticipate those kinds of crowds so i mean people do this with gamers like a lot like people make a lot of money from this right uh yeah like yeah and I, I mean live streaming is more of a gamer thing obviously um but um and I did it on YouTube, which is not like the biggest gaming stream, you know, streaming yeah. platform. But yeah. uh, but it's not that, not that I'm suggesting you should try to make money or that. But it's just like it's like people wanting to watch someone sitting at a computer doing something. There's like a, a market for that that I would have never anticipated. Yeah, it's it is surprising. Yeah. Um, but um, but I'll give you an example. So like you know, just the other day. Uh, I, I I don't know if you know there's like a there's a game called Kerbal Space Program um, that it's like Sounds a familiar it's yeah. like a space simulator basically and the kind of the most interesting interesting thing about it is that it like really replicates like the the actual laws of physics in space mm. um, so unlike other games where you like basically flying spaceships around as if they were airplanes um, you actually like 
it actually like obeys the laws of physics. Um, anyway, so there's like a new version that like was announced like two days ago, and it was weird because like I've never played this game, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I've watched other people play it like on their live streams, right? Really? Yeah, and it's like and I and it was like a level of excitement in me, not because like I was looking forward to playing the game. Mm-hmm. But because I was like looking forward to like seeing certain people play it online and watching, really, it play. like it was the strangest feeling I've ha- <laughs> ever had. You know what I mean? Wow, ever? Oh my gosh! Maybe not ever, but, <laughs> but it's a feeling I've never had before. I think. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> so I I need to find something to live stream so I can experience this in I, the broad range of human emotions. You know? <laughs> The doing the data analysis though, it's like it's weird because I think to make the live stream valuable to the audience, you do have to like talk it. You have to talk. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I feel like I don't want to talk. I just want to work. Right. And right. I feel like I'm not sure that makes for a particularly interesting thing to watch. So, um, mm-hmm. so it's a little unnatural. And I feel like when you're playing a video game, like maybe either you talk, or even if you don't talk, there's quite a bit of action, you know, yeah. to watch. Whereas yeah. like. Like there might be data analysis where I do nothing for five minutes just because I'm thinking about stuff and like that's not interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. So. That's that reminds me of the um, the design thinking book where they talked about like designers needing to talk in order for them to do the observational studies, right? And how that like fundamentally changed how they work to some degree yes. because it's this nonverbal communication going on. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the same exact thing. Like, I, it feels a little weird. It feels like I maybe I I did something different than I would have normally done. Yeah, yeah. I can totally see that. Yeah. Well, but it still is helpful, even if you did something different. Yeah. And, how else will we observe it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I think I will. I mean, the semester is about to start, so I, I have somewhat less time. I, I, do you, I, I think I might try to continue doing it. Yeah. Um, I think, think you should. You think I should? Yes, obviously. <laughs> I guess it, it provides <laughs> entertainment value for you. Have people watched it? Do you save it on YouTube afterwards? Yeah, it automatically saves afterwards. So what is the view count now? Oh, what, you try to like... Uh, you're not supposed to look at your at your views, right? Oh, okay. No. <laughs> okay. I'll go look. You don't have to. I'll go look later. But now, but now you're like, now I'm uh, curious. <laughs> if it's <I> much higher. <laughs> All right. Does so, it count the original views? Like the streamers, do they count as views? Hopefully. They right? do, yeah. But that was yeah. like 20, right? So the second live stream was is at 9.35. Really? Yep. Wow. That's very impressive. Yeah. I, I feel like I've made it. <laughs> you just need sponsors now. Like, <laughs> wear, you know. Make it SAS to sponsor me, right? I know. Wear a SAS shirt, like, <laughs> but use R while you're doing it. <laughs> I can, do you think I should become like a data science influencer, right? I mean, you already are. Well, I guess I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, I'm not making a lot of money off. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't yet monetized. Gosh, I was just reading something else about, um, no, it was in listening to this interview about the Talking Points Memo guy talking about how he was like one of the first bloggers, like one of the first serious, like, like professional ta- bloggers. Yeah. Like Talking Points Memo has been around for 20 years. So it's like a news site. It's like pretty left leaning, um, kind of news analysis and like really is driven by this guy, Josh Marshall, um, who's like a historian who kind of like like during his PhD started this, got distracted with it, eventually went back and finished his PhD, but like has, it's just like a full-time like news person now. And, um, but he was talking about how it's like, he wasn't really making money from it, but it was popular. And he just kind of had the attitude that I feel like all of us in like the, you know, influencer visibility world have, which is like, well, like, I don't know how to like, eventually make this a living but i'm just gonna keep doing like clearly something's happening and i'll trust that something will materialize eventually you know right. yeah and like for them it was ad money like he was one of the first people who did like banner ads and, or like oh, uh, yeah. mm-hmm. like google ads i can't remember blog ads or something and so like there was time he called it like dumb money because it's like you know no one had optimized it yet and now now like like advertisers 
like it's a pretty honed machine. Plus you have Facebook and Google and everyone like kind of controlling it way more. So people aren't making like tons of money off of ads. Right. But um yeah, he just at one point it was like he could have like had a serious job or done this blog and he just decided to do the blog. So the point is, Roger, you're investing in your reputation. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Okay. And who knows? Like, that's the thing you did. Who knows? And maybe one day, if you care to leverage it. I don't feel like the streamer thing is going to be the thing. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. Probably I, I'm not, not sure how much, like, how much, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, what's the word for, like, when the company grows and, like, there's, like, a ramp? What's, ah. Uh... Like the hockey stick growth? Yeah, like I don't know like what the angle of the hockey stick is for like live streaming <laughs> data analysis. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty like I don't know, it's not very steep, I think. D Rob definitely has that one on lockdown, whatever it is. Like, he hasn't done whatever. one in a while though. Oh really? His not tiny that I'm aware Tuesday. Of. Yeah, I thought he had done one recently. Or maybe okay, maybe I'm not keeping track. I should keep track. I thought I don't of, know someone suggested one of our listeners suggested I do a tidy Tuesday one. I thought this was a bad that's a pretty good idea actually. Yeah. Yeah. I learned a lot from watching him do analyses. Like he came to Etsy once and did, he like showed me how to like do an analysis. And it's like, I learned a ton. I was like, oh my God, like (laughs) you just changed the way I coded. Like, so I do think it's really valuable to see. Yeah. Even like, even like, um, I I think that's what, like, I feel like even when I was doing my little thing, I used some function and people were like, oh, I've never heard of that before. And like, it's like a function that I use every day, you know. And right. So I think there are like a lot of um, just little things like that that you can pick up. Yeah. And I think now that I'm thinking about this, I would so prefer to watch live coding than to go to someone's code and try to figure out what's happening in it. Yeah. Like, yeah. I would rather see it build than see the finished product and like reverse engineer it. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's uh I take it back. David Robinson, he did one like last week, so never mind. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we never talked about me at these conferences. Not that I have a lot of commentary, but which conferences did you go to? Yeah, so I had two um speaking engagements at one of them was called um it was I think the organization's called APRA and it's um a nonprofit group, like where they're like it's it was like prospect development i think so like nonprofits and how they work with um you know donors and stuff okay. and then they had a data analytics symposium as part of this larger kind of prospect development conference and um and so yeah i just gave um a talk on the So I had two talks. I had this one and then one with people who were plant pathologists and both of them i talked about the sort of designing and building a system, um, like a technical system for data analysis. Um, So saying like, you know, right now, if what you're doing is downloading people's information from Salesforce and, you know, pasting that into Excel and making some summaries and pasting that into an email, like that is a system, like you just designed a system. And like that itself is like a creative task and there are ways to design that system that are prone to error, ways to design it that's not. But like what you're doing and what data science do is like there it's not different. <laughs> like we're doing the same thing. Right. And and like introducing the idea of blameless postmortems as a way to like make it comfortable to talk about these systems and when the systems fail without blame and just, you know, how to talking about like the design challenges. So like, you know, you're going to have to do this at work, but how can you get better at it? Like try doing one at home with variance in commute times, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, in both cases, it was like, how do we use data better? And I went in and was like, I'm not going to talk about data (laughs) or I am going to talk about data, but not like what methods to use. I'm going to talk about like, like the actual thing that will cause errors for you and for data scientists that we never talk about, which is how do you make this end to end system work? Um, but yeah, so the, the nonprofit group was really great. Um, and then also this plant pathologist group, I was like really charmed by this. It was a academic, mostly academic conference, but in this very applied field, of of plant pathology, which is like plants dying from disease. Um, and like, I guess I didn't realize what a big, uh, deal this is because if you have like a state where one of the key, uh, 
economic drivers is the agriculture business, then when a field gets like infected with a disease, that's like a really big deal, right? And so these plant pathologists will like go to the different um, fields, like they do field consulting with the farmers and try to figure out what's going on. And like, and so um, it was like kind of great because the first talk was all about uh, like feet on the ground, you have to go to the field. Don't just rely on photos or someone's verbal description. Like it really matters your relationship with the people, with the field, with the plants. Like you'll be able to pick up on trends as long as you're like fully engrossed in this. And I was like, great. Like <laughs> that's like Sounds that's good. been my talking point for right. the last year too. Um, and so it was kind of nice because with that crowd specifically, like with the data science crowd, I feel like my message has been like care about the data generating process and like you can design the you can be the person who decides what data to collect in order to build a system. Right. But like with plant pathologists, I don't need to tell them that because like, like they're already down with it. Yeah, they're right. already like, yeah, of course. And I'm like, oh, well, that's like what like what they need prodding in is like, you know, taking the system design as like a f like a fundamental part of the job and also one that's like can be kind of fun or productive or like you can intellectually engage in not just like this chore you have to do um and not something you have to feel like ashamed over you know right um so yeah it was fun and then the the third talk so i did like the second um there were like these plenary sessions and the third one was all it was like an application um that was really cool about the american chestnut tree and how I guess we killed it off by importing chestnut trees from like Asia. Oh, so, okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, like in the 1800s. Yeah. I don't I mean, it was not as related. <laughs> it wasn't, I remember at the time thinking it was very related and now I can't totally remember why. Except okay. for that. It was just a really good narrative of like, like chestnut trees used to be like the most dominant tree in the East. And you see it all over, like, Americana, like, you know, chestnuts roasting on open fire. And, you know, it's like, it was this big thing. And um, what is it? Walden? Like, the, that's the name of the, the Henry David Thoreau. Yeah, right? Walden, yeah. Walden. It's, he talks about the chestnut trees a ton. But I guess they imported these trees in the 1800s from, like, other, like Asian chestnuts. Um, and they, like they had like diseases with them that just like wiped out the American chestnut population. So it's like billions of trees died. And so now this guy's trying to like revive them um, cause they're really good for the climate. And yeah, like they're just, I mean, like it was the most dominant tree in America for like most of, you know, that land masses history. <laughs> so like, obviously it was pretty well adapted to the climate. And so, yeah, but Anyway, you know, I, cool. I, I also have been reading about a little bit about plant pathology. Really? <laughs> well, <laughs> so actually this is related to this podcast because I just got this book called the, the World Atlas of Coffee. Oh, wow. And uh, it's actually, it's, I recommend it. It's like, it's kind of, I mean, no pun intended. It's a coffee table book. Um, <laughs> but I actually, ironically. It's a coffee I, table book about coffee tables. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a coffee, yeah. Not about coffee tables, about coffee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> another Seinfeld deep cut there, uh, but um, you know, but ironically, I got the ebook version of it, so it was like, <laughs> like the worst. That's like so so yeah. disappointing. Just leave like your Kindle out. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to read it anyway. It's a good book because it's just like it's a good book about coffee, but also um, uh, yeah, basically like the problem. The biggest problem with coffee is that like all of the plants around the world are kind of genetically very similar. Um, and so as soon as there's like some disease or some, uh, you know, parasite that affects one, like you could like wipe out all coffee. <laughs> that would be, that be would be a profound disaster. Like, I, yeah. I wonder what the economic impact of that would be. It's huge. Well, I think that, you know, that's part of what makes it very challenging to be a coffee farmer. Cause it, like, there's this thing called the coffee, coffee leaf rust, I think is what it's called. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple of like parasites and I think. You know, so like the when these things come, they come in like waves, and then it, it dramatically changes the supply and the, of coffee, and so prices are flying all over the place. Um, and I think that makes it very hard to be a farmer because it's like one time the some like you know one year the price is super high and it's or it's low, and like you know I, it's true for all kinds of you know plants, I guess. But right, corn, and yeah, soybeans, you know, so. yeah. 
No, it's, I definitely walked away with a bigger appreciation for this field after yeah. this. Like the fact that we accidentally wiped out like all of our trees of one species is just like that's pretty bad. Like, <laughs> I, like, <laughs> like that's like kind of horrifying. I mean, I think at the time, if you had told people like this tree is going to be gone, that would have been like deeply shaking, you know? Yeah, yeah. But coffee, I mean, that's like, I mean, not even the economic impact on the coffee producers and all the businesses around coffee, like. Even if you nulled out that, like just the impact of people not being caffeinated. <laughs> <laughs> Productivity is just going. <laughs> well, not, it's like you would, you would have so many people in like withdraw from a drug. Like it <laughs> would true, yeah. at, all at the same time. Yeah. I, that would be like, that would be crazy. It'd be ugly. Yeah. It'd be very ugly. But yeah. So anyway, yeah, it was fun. I like talking to non data science crowds. It's, it's, it's just such a different message, but there's there's something for everyone with yeah. the design thinking, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's nice that you can kind of adapt um the talk for the you know for a very different audience. Yeah, and like I wanted to just I wanted to say what would what I wanted to walk away feeling like I genuinely help people. Like, oh, their job is gonna be easier, or at least they're gonna be able to frame this work in a way that makes it easier for them to go forward. Right. Um, and so I think like talking about methods, it's like maybe a couple people in there would have benefited, but at least like this general framework, it's like hopefully some percent of the people think about their work differently and that is an unlock for them. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else you want to talk about? I don't think so. No. I feel like I probably forgot something. Oh, I have a coffee. F I knew I, I do have a coffee follow up. All right. Well, we have to get through that. Which is that you might have seen on Twitter, but I went to Whole Foods on a Tuesday and lo and behold, there was Oatly there. Oh, I saw the picture. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I bought two cartons. <laughs> and I know it was like an. I did not need to be lugging around two extra carton, but whatever. I did it. Yeah. Um, and I have to say that I think I prefer Oatly from a barista versus at home. Uh, what does that mean exactly? And the the frothing step, I think, is really important. Oh, for oh you mean like, okay, in like the, in the co not just like the Oatly is better somehow. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it is. I, I also, someone tweeted, I keep meaning to dig up this tweet and reply because I didn't reply, but um, they were like, doesn't that have canola oil in it? And I was like, does it? And it I does. Like, it, it does. does. Yeah. It's like one of the top ingredients. And I was like, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> but So, I, first of all, I, I go to Whole Foods like you know, every week on a Sunday usually. Um, yeah. And on I, Sunday? Really? Wow. So it, yeah. So, but I have found that the supply of Oatly has gone up well like, yeah it used to be like i could go a month and there would be nothing there uh and and recently it's been there every week i mean my coworker told me it's at costco now oh really so maybe they've like ramped up their uh production i think that they're i think they have i think they're building new factories and like getting ready but... there was a whole there was like a whole profile on them actually in uh in, it was bloomberg i can't remember what magazine it was but uh there i first of all, i didn't know they're like swedish yeah. Um, yeah. At my robot coffee bar, they describe it as super hip Swedish coffee milk <laughs> alternative. And I'm like, super hip. Okay. <laughs> and they also have like a like a skim milk version now. I yeah, I've which, seen that. Have you tried it? I, no, I wasn't, I wasn't wild about it. Um, I did not. I I just spent the time making sure I was getting the right one. I was like, <laughs> whatever this is, I don't care. I just want to make sure I don't accidentally get it. <laughs> Yeah. Although if it means less canola oil, then maybe I would. Well, that's kind of what I was hoping because I feel like the, like the original is like it's on the thick side for me. Yeah. And so I thought, well, okay, maybe this other one will be like a little bit thinner, but it was too thin. Um, mm. And so now I just get the right. They need the 2%. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I've decided firmly now that at home I'm going to do the sheep's milk. Oh the, yes, okay. that's the best. Okay, it's like twelve dollars for a pint or something. So <laughs> All right. I'm definitely not saving money. Right, and then um, and then when I like get it from my robot coffee bar uh, that has Oatly, I do Oatly in the afternoon. Or I'm gonna decide I don't want canola oil on this regular of a basis. I'm not yeah. sure yet. Okay, you know? but 
Yeah. They use the original word for canola oil, which is rapeseed oil. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I can see why you know. want a different word for that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I just, uh, yeah, I don't know how I missed that before, but oh well. Yeah. Um, that's good follow-up, though. Yeah, yeah. It was a little sad. It was a little bit of a deflation moment. But, I yeah. mean, also, I could buy a milk frother for home, which would be nice. But You're, um, you know, you're like, this is a slippery slope that you're going down right now. Well, yeah, because you have the whole shebang, right? Yes. We have, like, a machine with, like, a, mil- a milk steamer and everything. Yeah. It's like... I, I think I've talked about this before. Right now, my setup is so simple and so cheap where it's just like an AeroPress and a little like Turkish coffee, like, I don't know, thingy to heat milk up with. Right. Like, and I'm... Uh, my advice is just let it be. Yeah. That's sort of every time I'm like, oh, do I really want to invest in the maintenance of like a several thousand dollar machine? <laughs> the problem with the machine is that it's not a machine. It's a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> like... So the question is not, do you want to buy this machine? It's, do you want an entirely new hobby? Yeah. And if I were living like somewhere without 12 amazing coffee shops right. within walking distance, like yes. Like Baltimore? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, like Baltimore. But where I am now, it's just like, oh, or I could walk two blocks away and go to like this gorgeous stump town and, you know, not have to worry about anything. And yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, not there. <laughs>